other times it's in our everyday lives. But everywhere you look, divide and rule is there to see if you know what you're looking for. Now, one example that's really in the headlines at the moment is the the extraordinary um, decision on the face of it of Muslim countries to bomb other Muslim countries and other Muslims, like we have Saudi Arabia bombing um, in Yemen currently. But it all starts to um, make more sense when you realize that one of the great divide and rule examples is the dividing and ruling of Islam through two factions, the Sunni, the vast majority, and the Shia or Shiite. And when you start to realize that uh, Sunni dominated Saudi Arabia is bombing Shia rebels in um, Yemen, and that that so many of these Arab on Arab, Muslim on Muslim uh, conflicts and uh, assaults are actually along the lines of Sunni and Shia. Now, they agree, these two factions, on almost everything about Islam. Can't be true, Dave. It is. And what they don't agree on comes from something, you know, pinch me, it can't be true, ouch it is, from something like 1400 years ago, when the Prophet Mohammed left us, and two factions, now called Sunni and Shia, started arguing and killing each other over who should be his successor. The Sunni say one thing, and the Shia say it's a bloke called Ali. 1400 years ago. And it's still going on. And a few people can't control the world. It's a piece of cake. So you have now this faction of Sunni, because they're the dominant faction of Islam, which breaks down in meaning to something like people of the, of the tradition. And you have Shiite, or Shia, which is um, basically party of Ali, the bloke they sh said should have um, succeeded uh, Mohammed. Now, from that division, schism, all that time ago, has come so much that's happening today and is, like I say, in the headlines today. So you have um, so much of the Muslim world, not least Saudi Arabia, Qatar, etc., um, who are more focused on unseating and destroying Shia targets than they are their alleged targets and opponents like Israel. And there are many other connections between the ruling fake royals of Saudi Arabia and Israel, which explain that at a much deeper level. So you look at the, um, the emphasis and the targeting of Iran by much of these Sunni dominated countries and uh, their, um, their ruling elites and it just so happens that Iran is the major centre for the Shia Muslim faction sect and then you have Saudi Arabia and um, Qatar who have been supplying um, weapons, money and support um, for rebels in 
Syria to target the regime of Assad. Assad comes from a sect called the Alawites, which is a faction of the Shia Muslim sect. Alawite means, in effect, followers of Ali, the bloke they said should have succeeded Mohammed. And then you look at ISIS, ISIS in Iraq. ISIS is a Sunni Muslim operation. And Iraq has, one of the rare countries, has a majority of Shia Muslims. Not absolutely up in the 80-90%, but significantly more than half. And we saw this week um, a Shia cleric in Iraq saying that if the United States um, creates a Sunni uh, section of Iraq and a Kurdish section of Iraq as in effect separate countries, then the Shia um, of Iraq in its different forms will be at war with the United States as a result of that. And of course, people who've read my books and, 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 and others will um, know that the plan all along has been to break Iraq up into, uh, in effect, regions. Why? To divide and rule, to break up unity. That's the whole point. Divide and rule is bloody everywhere. So, we have um, this situation, which I was uh, writing about in the books many, many years ago, in which I was pointing out that what was coming in the Middle East was a massive campaign to play Shia off against Sunni, to divide and rule, and then as a result of that, take over the Middle uh, East. And that is what we're seeing. When I first um, wrote about the scale of it and the names involved in a book called The Biggest Secret in the late 1990s, it was seen as outrageous. Couldn't be. That couldn't happen. Now, as more and more comes out, people are beginning to reevaluate their scale and their perception of the possible. And to, to understand the nature of what is happening and the, the scale of it, the depth of it, you've really got to, really got to get our heads around the fact that um, pure undiluted evil is directing the world and manipulating events and that what you see in the apparent world that we experience is merely a facade, it's merely a movie screen behind which untold unspeakable evil goes on. The latest uh, strand in this hidden web to start to appear now is the former cabinet minister, former home secretary and other positions in the Margaret Thatcher administration in the 1980s called Leon Britton. He died um, a few days ago and as a result the open secret that was not spoken due to libel laws etc and outright suppression, um, the unspoken secret started to be revealed. Here's a, just a, a couple of newspaper headlines. Britain abused me when I was 10 is um, one of them. Another one, um, cops filmed Leon Britain at underage abuse house. And so it goes on. Uh, I've been investigating 
the paedophile networks, the elite paedophile networks involving some of the most famous people on the planet for uh, two decades. And um, Leon Britton was a name that came up um, quite often in the uh, accounts of people who were describing what had happened to them. So I've been watching the Leon Britton evolving situation with a shaking head because when it was announced that uh, Jeffrey Dickens, the Conservative MP, had handed a dossier of elite paedophiles to Leon Britton when he was Home Secretary in the Thatcher government and that this dossier, um, having been given to Britain, went missing, um, it was like, well, it's obvious why it went missing, because Leon Britton was a paedophile within the Westminster Downing Street paedophile ring that Dickens was in part exposing. It's no coincidence that the Thatcher Attorney General at the time was a man called Michael Havers, who is now named by victims as participating in paedophile parties where children were abused. And it was the same Michael Havers who um, sought, at the same time as Leon Britton, to stop the naming of a British diplomat uh, as a paedophile. So when Michael Havers' his sister, Baroness Butler Sloss, was named to head the inquiry into the, the dossier and what happened to it and why it went missing involving Leon Britton, then you start to realise that they're laughing at us and there's another agenda here, and it's not to expose those responsible for elite paedophilia. When you then have an outcry about the ludicrousness of Butler Sloss's appointment by Home Secretary, currently Theresa May, and the next one installed is Fiona Wolfe, Lord Mayor of London, who is a friend, seems to be a close friend, of Leon Britton's wife, friend too of Leon Britton, and lives in the same street as Leon Britton, when Leon Britton is the star main witness of the inquiry into what the heck happened to that dossier, etc. Then you know, like I say, that the agenda is not to reveal the truth, but to keep the lid on it. What they're actually saying is, we'll leave, we'll leave no stone unturned unless one of our people is underneath it. And then you have the situation where Leon Britton dies of cancer, and what is called, um, he died after a long battle against cancer. Well, why wasn't that mentioned when this inquiry was set up, why wasn't it uh, relevant when, because of the ludicrous nature of the appointees to head the inquiry, it was delayed and delayed and delayed as people said, you know, there's no credibility having this person or this person, so delay, delay, delay. Why was that not brought to the surface? Hey, this man is... Uh, clearly, in, in um, a late stage of cancer, as it turned out, if, if the cancer story is true, and, and yet there was no urgency to get him before anybody to be questioned, while they still could. Instead, he, he died, and with him, the ability to question him about what happened. Now, there was um, a 
another guy who was head of the children's home, manager of the children's home, a guy called Stingemore, who was head of the children's home that was supplying children to be abused at a place called the Elm Guest House in London. And one of the people named on the list of abusers by people who were connected to Elm House was Leon Britton. One of the people exposing this says that he saw pictures of Leon Britton with naked children at the Elm House on his knee. So, within a few days of each other, Stingemore dies just before he's um, supposed to appear in court to face charges. And then Britain dies before he can be questioned by the inquiry. And it turns out, after he died, when it was revealed, before he can be questioned by police about the raping of boys about a boy being beaten to death in front of him and other issues. And when you've, um, when you've been on the road of researching this subject for as long as I have now, it's another head shaker because you're just seeing repeated the same methods and techniques of cover-up so it doesn't come out and that's what we're seeing now more and more blatantly for those around the world who may not have uh, seen as much of that story as we have in Britain what has happened is this countries have been bombed manipulated into civil war had their resources stolen and their societies manipulated by the countries of the West who love freedom. And as a result of that, not surprisingly, who wouldn't, they have tried, with their families often, to make the perilous journey to what they believe is a new land of prosperity. This, for those at Calais, is perceived to be Britain. And so they have taken their lives and their families' lives into great danger often by crossing the Mediterranean in terrible situations and great dangers because of the craft they have been travelling on orchestrated by ruthless psychopathic people traffickers they have then made this journey across Europe to Calais and now they are trying through whatever means they can to get across to Britain. This has created fantastic disruption on both sides of the channel. Apparently the last I read some 6,000 lorries or trucks have been lined up on the British side which can't get through the um, hold-ups into Europe. Businesses are being disrupted, some no doubt destroyed by not being able to get supplies and customers to their business because of all the hold-ups. And so what you have, as frickin' usual in the Madhouse, is that two groups of victims of the psychopaths are having different 
consequences of the psychopathic actions. And then the psychopaths try to play the victims off against each other, so we might just ignore the cause of it. And so we have a situation this week where the British Prime Minister, the truly vacuous David Cameron, has been making speeches about the problem of swarms of people heading for Britain and how he will not let them in and he will deal with it and we must be strong. No mention that that freaking arsehole, along with Obama and Hollande and all these other people, the French leaders of the time, have been fundamentally responsible for creating the problem now in need of a solution. And if you go deeper into the agenda, it's worth remembering this. Manipulating and redirecting harmony is extremely difficult. What do you mean you want to change this and change that? Everything's fine. Go away. Manipulating chaos, manipulating fear, manipulating mayhem. Piece of cake. And does anyone really think that the psychopaths weren't well aware, especially those in the shadows, that drive and puppeteer these Cameron, Obama, Bush puppets, that they never knew that as a result of what they'd done and are continuing to do in North Africa and the Middle East, that what is happening now in terms of migrants and dispossessed people was not the inevitable outcome. But we must be diverted from these conclusions by stories like um, this. Calais migrant crisis. Cameron warns Britain is no safe haven. My goodness, he's so strong. Britain will become, or not become, because he's strong, a safe haven for migrants in Calais, David Cameron has warned after hundreds continued their attempts to reach the UK. The Prime Minister warned illegal immigrants would be removed from the UK as, as migrants told the BBC they remained determined to reach Britain. Mr Cameron was speaking after people gathered for a third night at fencing at the Channel Tunnel freight terminal. More than 3,500 people have tried to get into the tunnel terminal this week. And... Irony of ironies, or actually, appropriately, Cameron was speaking in Vietnam, another country I recall that was devastated by the lovers of peace and freedom. Speaking in Vietnam, Mr Cameron said, everything that can be done will be done to make sure our borders are secure and make sure that British holidaymakers are able to go about their holidays. Woo, yay, good man. The Prime Minister acknowledged the situation was very testing. Well, the Prime Minister's very testing every time I look at him because there was a, quote, swarm of people uh, coming across the Mediterranean seeking a better life, but the UK and France were working together, just as they worked together to devastate Libya. Just as these people are working together to devastate Libya. Syria and other countries on a global agenda for which they are just puppets, not initiators. They are in the shadows. Another story this week. UK spent 13 times more on bombing Libya than it paid to help rebuild the country.
what happens is the psychopaths who are selected because they're psychopaths by the psychopaths in the shadows to be the visual leaders of the psychopathic agenda called prime ministers, presidents and all the rest. They manipulate, lie, orchestrate, make excuses to bomb, slaughter and devastate country after country. And they spend billions and billions and endless billions. When was the last time you ever heard anyone say, well, we'd like to go to war, but we can't afford it. No, no, they can't afford basic humanity for people. But war, no problem. And they spend these billions and billions ongoing. And they devastate countries. Then they spend just a little bit more, more but far less in total. Um, rebuilding the country, just paying lip service to it, really, not really rebuilding it at all. And then, after having spent all that money, then they tell the people back home that actually um, we have to have austerity programs because we, we've got no money and we've got this debt and we've got to do something about it. And it goes on generation after generation after generation. And so we're seeing the same um, again. And what it means is that because the psychopaths of the agenda um, control the, the military with most capability, i.e. NATO, etc., and overwhelmingly they control the perceptions of the media in terms of the way these things are reported, it means that they can do all the things they condemn others for, and worse, and never be collared for it. And yet, the ones who are on the losing side, who do often far less than has been done by the moral West and its psychopathic leaders, they get the consequences. They end up in the International Criminal Court for war crimes, while the biggest war criminals on the planet, are you listening, Tony Blair? And you too, Cameron, get away with it. And you, George Bush. In fact, America and Israel don't even recognise the International Criminal Court, and that's probably good for the court itself, because if the war criminals in the United States and Israel were actually to be prosecuted, the numbers would be so overwhelming the court couldn't cope. I'm going to develop this theme into the whole arena of what we bravely, outrageously, crazily call education. And the first story I'm going to start with is of this. Okay? It's a boy. He's aged 10 and he's had his hair cut. And, well, there's actually a big end. Because he wanted his hair cut like this guy. A guy called Aguero. For those around the world um, who maybe are not in football countries. I, there can't be many. He is a very famous footballer in Britain and he has a particular haircut as you can see and this lad wanted the same haircut. Fair enough. He's a boy. Why wouldn't he? Ah, ah, but he had broken the golden rule. Thou shalt conform and thou shalt not challenge conformity even if it's a bloody haircut. Right, this is the news story. Bear with me, I'm not making it up. My goodness me, you have no idea how much I wish I was. Schoolboy ordered to wear a hat, I kid you not, in lessons, because his Sergio Aguero style short back and sides is too extreme. <laughs> there is one too extreme in this story, and that's the school and the lunatics that run it. OK, it goes on. A schoolboy who had his hair cut like uh, football idol Sergio Aguero 
has been ordered to wear a hat in lessons or stay home until it grows back. Could be a while, his family claim. Ten-year-old Tom Mosley was told his short back and sides hairstyle, modelled on the Manchester City striker, was too extreme by staff at St Gilbert's Primary School in Winton Eccles, and he was removed from school on his birthday. Well, that was his birthday present. He got out of jail, which is what schools have become. Actually, maybe you've always been. Anyway, I'll get into that as we, we develop this theme through this video cast. Um, his family uh, say they were told that he could either return to classes when his hair had grown, restyle it, or wear a hat at all times. Parents, Lisa, 39, and Kirk, 43, have attacked the school's decision and have decided to keep Tom out of school. Good on ya, good on ya. Likening the school's hat suggestion to wearing a dunce's cap. We can borrow the head teachers if he wants. Uh, Mr. Mosley said, He's being punished for a haircut, but he has consistently achieved good results and he's well behaved in class. Doesn't matter. He's not conforming. The software program is miffed. We were given three options, he said. Take him out of school until it grows. Best one. Then cut it again so he stay out of school longer. Get it cut or sit in class wearing a hat. And he won't be allowed to play football at school. He would also have to sit outside the head teacher's office at break times wearing the hat. Did I, did I mention I wasn't making this up? Oh, how I wish I was. Um, so his, um, his dad said, we decided to keep him out of school because I'm not having him sitting with the equivalent of a dunce, dunce's cap on, uh, uh, hat on. Now, talking of dunce's hats. Head teacher Cheryl Fox said, We set out clear standards on hair and dress at this school, which parents are made fully aware of and accept when pupils enrol. She goes on. We always suggest that an unsuitable haircut, unsuitable to whom, pray, can be trimmed into an acceptable style without going down the skinhead route or that the child can wear a hat of their choice in school. What if the hat doesn't conform? What then? It gets complicated. She goes on. If the parents wish to keep the child away from school until the haircut grows out, we will ensure their education does not suffer. Why? You're going to stay away from them, are you? Eh? Don't go near them. Then their education might prosper. But this is the classic. This is the classic. This is the classic quote that encompasses not just the education system, the sausage machine programming system, but... Human society as a system in general. I quote the head teacher. It is our responsibility to prepare children for high school, college, university and employment where they will be expected to follow the rules of the establishment or dress code of their employer. We want our children to succeed and will continue to do all we can towards that aim. Classic. Our responsibility to prepare children for high school, college and university. He's 10. And employment where they will be expected to follow the rules of the establishment or dress code of their employer. He's 10, because that's what school is. Have you heard this phrase they come up with all the time now? We must prepare children for the workplace. No, we must prepare the workplace, human society, for children. The system should serve humanity. Humanity should not, as it does, serve it through crap. Like this, they are not preparing children to access all their infinite potential. 
for expression, expressing their expression, expressing their individuality and uniqueness. They are preparing them to be a cog in a machine called the system. And this head teacher is another cog in the machine, creating other cogs. And her like are all around the world in what we call the education system. Now, there's another one. Another story this week. There he is. Seems to be a lovely bloke. He's what we call in Britain a lollipop man. For those around the world that don't have lollipop men, uh, they stand with this well, black and white here, but it's a very bright sign. And they stand in the road outside schools when the schools are, you know, opening and closing. So they help the children safely across the road. Right. I mean, simple. Yeah. No, nothing is simple with a system that is simpleton. OK, this is the story. And again, it's about destroying diversity, spontaneity, uniqueness. Conform. Here we go. Council orders lollipop man to stop high-fiving children. Hey, all right, mate, how you doing? No, that's human interaction. That's spontaneity. That's happiness <laughs> we can't have it the software is miffed again <clears throat> here's a story a dumbarton that's up in scotland for people around the world a dumbarton lollipop man has been banned by the local council from high-fiving children as they cross the road nasana his name nasana um, is known as Scotland's happiest lollipop man due to his singing and dancing at work. Because he not only high-fives the kids as they go across the road, he's standing in the middle there, he has a little dance, hey? Isn't that what life's about? Joy? No, not to the system. Joy? Joy! Arrest that man! Okay. We'll go on <laughs> with the madness. Oh. Sometimes I think it must be me, but then I think, Nah, it's not. West Dunbartonshire Council, for it is they, said safety fears were behind the decision. But school parents have questioned the council's reasoning. Well, they're, they're calling it reasoning. I mean, you know, I guess they have to come up with some kind of word. Uh, with one father, David Dufton, starting a Facebook campaign to try to reverse the move. A statement from West Dumbartonshire Council said, presses enter to activate software. All patrollers are instructed when crossing children over a road to remain static with one hand on their stick and the other stretching outwards. All right, I'm conforming. OK. This ensures that they can be seen and effectively provides a barrier between school pupils and the traffic. Let's work our way through this. Doing that, standing still, between the cars and the kids, is safe but doing that all right mate hey standing between the kids and the traffic is unsafe now this ensures that they can be seen and effectively provides a barrier between school pupils and the traffic now what a driver's going to do they're going to come up and they'll say well he's standing still with, and he's got one hand on his stick and the other arm's out, I'm going to stop. And the next time they come along, no, he's dancing and I five in, I'm having him. Boom. Did I mention the world was freaking insane? I think I might have done. You know, you've only got to look at the usual bloody suspects to see that staying in the European Union 
is not good for the rest of us. You've got the snake oil salesman, um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, who's desperate to uh, keep Britain in the EU because he's got himself in a right mess. He um, offered a referendum to try to offset what he saw as the threat at the ballot box from UKIP, the uh, UK Independence Party, which is vehemently anti-EU and wants to come out. And he also felt, um, I'm sure, that he wasn't going to win the last election outright. It would probably end up as another coalition like the one before, and the other coalition partner would stop the vote and the referendum he was promising on coming out of the EU. So he thought, well, I've covered all bases there. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for everybody, really, um, he won the election outright and he was stuck with having to uh, fulfil the promise of a referendum to leave the EU. And he is running round like uh, a headless chicken now, trying to um, persuade people to stay in a centralised, bureaucratic fascist communist dictatorship in the unfolding and what's happening is um, there are lies galore the usual uh, technique when you want people to do something it's frighten them to death to make them do what you want them to do and so you have um, key repeating phrases here's a few of them Leap in the dark. Ooh, leap in the dark. That's scary. Um, by coming out. Actually, haven't we been out for most of the history of this country? Um, safe, stronger, better off. Safe or safer. Another version. Strength in numbers. Fear on your own. Ooh. Cost, cost you your job. Oh, you'll lose your job if we come out. Ooh, yeah, fear, fear, fear. Best of both worlds. We can stay in and be a sovereign nation. What? I, I had to laugh when, 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 when Scotland was trying to get independence, which I supported, by the way. I think everyone should, should have independence and, and, and autonomy. But to claim that um, Scotland was going to be independent while still inside the European Union was ludicrous. There are no independent nations inside the European Union. That's not what the EU is there for. It's to take away independence, which, of course, it's been doing stage by stage by stage by stage uh, through what I call the totalitarian tiptoe ever since it was created. And we have a situation now where on top of all the fear and on top of all the manipulation, on top of all the lies we're having a situation that ministers um, in the government who are uh, in favour of coming out, uh, they've been told that the civil service, publicly funded, by the way, civil service, can't help them and can't support them in their campaign to come out. But those ministers that are following the Cameron line and um, campaigning to stay in, they can be supported and helped, massively so, by the publicly funded civil service. And this, for campaigns for a public, supposed to be open, independent, referendum. It's all a scam. And... You've got the media bias through people like the BBC and it, it's, it's all um, uh, uh, skewed in favour of the, um, the stay-in campaign. And then you look, like I said, at the people in favour of it. You've got snake oil salesman, Cameron, and Tony Blair. Tony Blair, war criminal. And in fact, snake oil salesman, war criminal for what happened in Libya and Syria, and it's still happening. And then you've got these heads of giant corporations, they're all in favour of staying in, must be good for them then. And you've got 
former defense chiefs um, who were helping to orchestrate all these uh, wars and invasions. They want to stay in. And when you look at, at that bunch of characters, not least Blair, Cameron, heads of corporations, etc., if they want it, then it is almost certainly, virtually every time, bad for the rest of us. Which brings me to Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party, who are also in favour of staying in. You know, I was pleased when Jeremy Corbyn won the election to be the leader of the opposition Labour Party. Because at least it would trigger some kind of genuine debate on all the austerity um, policies and programmes, creating great deprivation in this country by the snake oil salesman government. So I was glad on that alone. But there were many things I disagreed with him on. Uh, two, two major things. One, his support for the ludicrous um, fantasy of human-caused global warming and climate change. Even his brother, Piers Corbyn, who's a weather expert, uh, is, has been widely saying for years it's all a load of nonsense. So that was one area that I disagreed with him on. And the other one, fundamentally, was his support for continued membership of the European Union. And it's kind of a, a bit strange, really, to have the people I've just described, all of which Jeremy Corbyn would have no time for whatsoever, and yet he's standing shoulder to shoulder with them to try to persuade the British people to um, stay in the European Union. I think that's sad, and I think it's desperately misguided because it betrays a complete lack of understanding of what the EU agenda really is and has always been. Those others, snake oil and war criminal, they know what the agenda is. That's why they're supporting it. And what um, those that are genuine but misguided need to um, appreciate is what the EU is really all about. Since 20, 25 years now, I've been exposing what it is and what it, it um, was wanting to do and what it has wanted to do has unfolded ever since, step by step. This is the game. We're being taken step by step to a global centralised society based on a world government, world central bank controlling all finance, world army imposing the will of the world government. This is what NATO is and the expansion and constantly uh, uh, NATO operating outside its designated area that I said in my books it would do back in the 90s. It's all over the bloody place now. And um, a world currency, which would be cashless, no cash. Look around, what's happening in terms of the cashless society? And under this structure, this global structure, are designed to be super states. There's the European Union, obviously, uh, the first one that's, that's really um, a long way along to its goal. They want an American Union. We have the African Union. Uh, they want, they'll have a Middle East Union. They'll have a, a Pacific Union involving Australia and New Zealand. And, and what, they're, what they're all, uh, uh, in terms of the European Union, has done and what the others are in the process of doing is um, being evolved to what the European Union has become, and then some, because it's not stopped yet, from free trade areas. Get them get them into the the web by selling them free trade areas, just like the European Union, 
the European Economic Community, the EEC. It's only about jobs. It's not about political union. When we now know from released documents that the, um, well, words fail me, Prime Minister of Britain, Ted Heath, um, was giving away sovereignty in the, the future. As a matter of course, when he was negotiating British entry. Those um, official documents show that he was uh, uh, agreeing as part of the negotiation to go in to the European Union as it became in the early 1970s to destroy basically Britain's fishing industry, to destroy the mining industry and manufacturing industry to a very, very large extent. And um, all of those things have happened since we came in because they were agreed as part of entry, but the people weren't told, that's all. And so if we look at these um, super state um, structures like the EU, the plan within those is to destroy countries, to end all sovereignty, to end all nations and break these um, unions up into regions. The maps are already there. Some of them have been published. And so um, the idea is to have a world government dictating to these union superstates and the union superstates dictating to the regions of the superstate with countries uh, gone. And so the idea of the European Union is to get more and more and more power at the centre, which of course it's been doing ever since it was created. And the idea that they are now going to somehow hand back power to Britain as part of this snake oil salesman um, negotiation that he claims to have made is ridiculous. They want more power at the centre, not less. It's all a facade. It's all um, just to persuade enough people to vote to stay in. Phew, got away with it. And the reason, I've done a, a whole video cast on this, which you can uh, see on my uh, YouTube channel um, or on the, the, the website. Um, and the migration crisis that's happened where vast, vast numbers of people have been um, allowed into Europe, um, many justifiably so, fleeing from wars, many, many, many who are doing it to, um, to use it as a, 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 an opportunistic way of getting into Europe for their own reasons. This vast influx of migrants has been allowed not least in places like Germany, by Chancellor Merkel, who is, um, you know, when uh, this hidden cabal says jump, she breaks the Olympic eye jump record. Um, the reason it's been done in such a open the doors and uh, anything goes way is the, the plan is to break the sense of national identity among European countries to break down those cultures. And in doing so, of course, those that are um, coming in and those already there are both min being manipulated to an end by um, this hidden hand, which is playing one off against the other. They want conflict. They want upheaval. It helps them to justify more and more um, police state in positions to meet the, the, the solution to the problem of, of um, upheaval in Europe. Um, but the, the, the reason in relation to what I'm talking about now is to dilute a sense of national culture which um, makes people more open and less resistant to this European Union um, uh, plan, agenda, to just take away countries, dismantle them and break them up into regions. Like I say, the um, maps uh, already exist. 
And so if we look at this quote from a guy called Jean Monnet, he's known as the founding father of the European project, the EU. And this is what he wrote in a letter to a friend on April the 30th, 1952. What's that? Nearly um, 64 years ago. And he said this. Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, uh, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. They've been manipulating, that's what I call the totalitarian tiptoe, step by step by step by step, ever since the uh, European um, common market was introduced, because that was the plan from the start. And that's why they're so desperate not to let nations uh, go um, out of the European Union because the idea is to pull more and more in. So anyway, I've made my decision, not that there was a decision to make. Uh, I had these T-shirts uh, made, um, which you get one on the website if you like, uh, because the more that we can um, get this information out, about the real agenda of the European Union and what's really happening, um, the better chance we have of, um, of shocking the establishment and getting out of this straitjacket, fascist, communist, bureaucratic, centralised superstate. And what I suggest the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn think on is whether a European Union run by dark suit, fat cat uh, bureaucrats in league with dark suit, fat cat uh, heads of giant corporations, in league with um, manipulating cabals that actually run the European Union, whether they actually will have any care whatsoever about the people that the Labour Party is supposed to represent. They're the target of these people. Why do you think austerity is everywhere? And you think the European Union is a way out of it? It's a way further into it. Because that's what it's meant to be. Wake up, Labour Party. Wake up, Jeremy Corbyn. See what's going on, what the real agenda is. And then you might realise how misguided, misguided beyond belief it is for you to be supporting staying in this horrific exercise. Because what they're doing now and what they will do right the way through to this referendum on what June the 23rd is they'll try to frighten you and frighten you and frighten you, not least economically, all your jobs and all that stuff. This is not, this is not at its core about economics. It's about freedom. It's about self-respect. It's about the, the freedom for people within a country to decide what happens in that country, to have laws decided in that country that affect that country, so that there is at least some sort of accountability. Accountability with the bureaucrats in Brussels? Are you having a laugh? It's about the self respect of not having some arrogant, fat cat, dark suit, dictating your life from far away, according to an agenda that ain't good for any of us. That's what this referendum's about. They'll try to frighten you about this, frighten you about that. But that's the core. 
It's about freedom and it's about self-respect. And the British people have the choice now. Are they going to grasp that? Or are they going to run away? Oh, no, we better stay here. I don't like it. We better stay in because they've said this will happen. Yeah, and who are they? The people who will benefit from staying in. If we don't vote to get out of this, now the opportunity is there. Those that vote to stay in, they deserve to stay in so they can see what a ludicrous decision they made in the face of the evidence. Out. Freedom. Self-respect. Give the establishment a shock that it didn't think was coming catastrophic as that has been for so many people. The number of lives it's destroyed, the number of opportunities it's destroyed. That what happened in 2008 and in its aftermath is almost as nothing compared with what is planned. And now we have a opening to 2000 and 16 that has had the Chinese markets casinos uh, in turmoil and this has had a knock on effect to other markets casinos all around the world and you add in the collapse in the oil price which in any sane society any sane economy should be a good thing but in this nonsense in this ludicrous economic madhouse that we have foisted upon us apparently it's a bad thing and the question for many people will be well why do you want to crash the economy well what's planned is what I've been What's planned, what is unfolding before our eyes, is what I've termed the Hunger Games Society. This is being manipulated from the shadows and it's been going on for a long, long time. And this is the plan. You have a elite of less than 1% of the world population dictating everything through a world government, world central bank, world army, uh, a microchip population, that's what this transhumanism is all about. And um, you then have not the working classes, as it's been up to this point, uh, you have the vast majority of the rest of the population subjugated by this less than 1% in abject poverty and servitude and slavery. That's the plan. And then in the middle between the elite less than 1% and the poverty stricken masses you have the police state the merciless police state imposing upon the masses the will of the less than 1%. Now I've been going on about this for um, so long and every day it moves further forward. Now what you need to do to bring about that structure, that situation, is to part the vast majority of the world's population from their money, from their wealth, from their, as far as it goes, means of independence, control of their lives. And what we've seen up to this point is when, a, say, a banking system is crashed, governments, i.e. the people, come along and bail out the banks. And what they do then, and we've seen that since 2008, what they call a, a bailout 
is actually a transfer of responsibility, financial responsibility for the crash, which was the work of the banks and the hidden hand behind the financial system. The responsibility is moved from the banks via governments to the population who were subjected to the consequences of what the banks have done. Look at what's happened since 2008. You had the crash in the banking system, you had banks and, and major insurance companies etc. in trouble, desperate trouble, on the brink of collapse trouble, and then we had this massive bailout by governments. Stage one, the problem, the responsibility for the problem is transferred from the banks who caused it to the governments that helped cause it by removing regulation. Um, and so now the government is holding the responsibility for the bank's behaviour. And then, next stage, that is transferred to uh, vast numbers of the population in what's called austerity. We've got no money, we've had to bail out the banks, we've got no money, we can't pay for you to have the basics of life. Wars? Oh yeah, we've got money for them. Total scam all of it. But even at that stage, we still have great numbers of people who are not in the less than 1%, who are still all right. They still have um, what a lot of people would call a lot of money, a lot of wealth. You have a, a lot more people who are, they're, we're okay. But if they're not part of the less than 1%, they want their money too. They want them in economic servitude. So how can they do that? Well, that is where not the bailout, but the bail-in comes in. And it all really started with the banking crash in Cyprus in 2013. When instead of governments bailing out the banks, they said above a certain amount, which is guaranteed within the European Union, 100,000 uh, euros at the time, anything above that was fair game for the banks to take from their own depositors to be bailed out. And a lot of people who were, by most standards, had a lot of money, had a lot less when that process in Cyprus was over. Because much of what they had above the guaranteed 100,000 euros was just taken, gone, blink of an eye. And this set the precedent, absolutely on purpose, all planned all along and now we have a situation where they're saying any more banking crashes and the bail-in is what will be used to respond to it and uh, the start of January in uh, Britain, the amount of money guaranteed in banks for depositors by the, uh, the government was reduced from uh, £85,000 to £75,000. And then um, when the bail-ins come in, anything above that will be um, fair game to be taken because you put money in a bank. What does that mean? It just means that you've given your money to the bank and you are an unsecured creditor. That's what you are as a depositor. So, um, this bail-in is a means to um, steal the wealth of people who at the moment are feeling they're alright. Because they are in the gun sights of all this because of the Hunger Games society and the poverty-stricken uh, slave masses that I'm uh, talking about. 
The financial system has been created from the start so that a few can control the many. Think of um, all the things you'd like to do in your life. If you could really make any choice, and invariably, if you can't do it, it will be because you don't have enough money. So money, control of money, equals choice. Control of money and how you earn money and how money is shared out dictates your basic freedom. Whether you've got to be somewhere at this time in the morning until this time in the afternoon, doing something you absolutely hate day after day just to earn the money to survive. The financial system has been systematically created to impose global slavery. And now what I'm talking about with these manufactured crashes um, and the bail-ins is to take that on and on and on until we reach the Hunger Games Society situation that I described uh, a few minutes ago. So, when you look at the financial system, First of all, banks are lending money, he said in quotes, called credit, that has never, does not, and will never exist as a real, um, a real substance, a real something. Just figures on the screen. And you not only are borrowing figures on a screen, money out of fresh air, called credit, you have to pay the banks for it in what we call interest. There are many, many things that come from this. First of all, the banks are allowed to lend uh, ten times and more. It's actually many more in truth but at least nine, ten times what they have on deposit. It's called fractional reserve lending. Every time you put a, a, a pound or a dollar in a bank, you're giving it the right to lend nine or ten. It, hasn't ha it doesn't have. Call credit. And so, um, when you go to a bank for a loan, say $50,000, um, all the bank is doing is typing into your account $50,000 pulled out of fresh air under the ludicrous rules of fractional reserve lending. How did this come about? As I've been exposing in the books for years and years and years, the same force that owns the banks, owns the governments, that make the laws, that affect the banks. That's how it works. So, you, um, you borrow, in theory, £50,000 from a bank. They type into your account £50,000. That's what they do. Um, and you then go away and you, you spend £10,000 of that um, to buy a car. So you, you give um, the owner of the car some fresh air money that has been given to you. And he then puts the £10,000 in... Um, or dollars, whatever it is, in um, his bank. Now, his bank could lend ten times that on money that was fresh air, and it's still fresh air, but was fresh air when it was created. And this just shows you how much um, theoretical money, i.e. profits, that one single loan can create in the banking system and there's another thing you borrow this £50,000 £50, but you're not paying back that, you're paying back £50,000 plus interest the interest is never created thus there is never ever nearly enough money to um, pay back all the debt 
and all the interest on the debt that is outstanding at any point. Thus, people losing their homes, their jobs, their businesses, their land, their property, they're all built into the system on purpose. And what this is allowed to happen is for the banks, in exchange for fresh air created out of nothing credit, to steal the real wealth of the world. We'll give you nothing, or you're going to pay us to do it, and then you give us the real wealth of the world. And this has been going on century after century, and this is how the less than 1%, or major, major reason why, the less than 1% now owns um, virtually half the wealth of the world. This is how they've done it. And so the financial system, and most of these financial journalists and economists, they don't bloody understand it. It's a simple structure you've got to look at. Not all the bloody jargon and stuff that no one understands, including most of the people saying it. The financial system has been created on purpose as a means of control and dictatorship. And because it is um, built on nothing, fresh air, it's all about what they call in the markets, the casinos, confidence, market confidence. So when you're confident, you spend more money, you borrow more money, you invest more money, in theory money. And when you lose confidence, you do the opposite. You stop spending, you stop investing, you stop uh, um, all the things that happen during a boom, and suddenly you've got a recession. And one of the key things that creates, or the key thing that creates a recession, is the inability of people to raise or borrow mm, what they call money. So we had, after 2008, what did they call it? The credit crunch. And so who decides how much money is in circulation? Whether there's a, uh, a, an abundance of uh, units of exchange in circulation, or whether there's a credit crunch? The banks. Because the vast, overwhelming majority of money comes into circulation at the start as a debt, the unit of exchange that allows um, human life to, to happen and for choices to be made and for lives to be lived, starts out its life as a debt. Why aren't governments creating money interest-free so it becomes a unit of exchange from the start and not a unit of debt. Because, I repeat, the same hidden hand that controls the banks controls the governments. And um, Abraham Lincoln issued interest-free money called greenbacks in the United States. Um, what Abraham to Abraham Lincoln not too long afterwards, he was no longer with us because this creation of money out of nothing is absolutely fundamental to the control of the hidden hand. So it's, um, it's a figment of our imagination, the financial system. And I've likened it many times to... Have you ever seen these cartoons where there's cartoon characters chasing each other on a big, big chase. And they run off the edge of a cliff. And um, for a while, because they haven't realised they've run off the edge of the cliff, because they've concentrated on the chase, they keep going forward on fresh air. And then there comes a point where someone looks down and realises there's no land under their feet anymore. They're in a, you know, mid-air over a canyon. And what happens then? All gone. Now that's how the financial system works. 
What they do, because of course they also own uh, the media, this inland, and they certainly own the minds of so many that uh, comment on the financial um, situation in the world who have no clue really how it works. Um, they build up what they call market confidence. And when that happens, there's a boom, and, and the banks lend loads of, loads of money, that's great. And then um, they create a boom. And people get into more debt because they've got this confidence, and they invest in the stock markets because they've got this confidence, stock market's going up. And then, um, having built that confidence up, they then start to, by any means that they choose, to destroy that confidence. Oh, there's a financial crisis, yeah. And that's what they're doing now. And uh, what happens then is people look down and go, oh, it's fresh air. That happened in 2008. And what they do is they say, um, uh, you're running, on, you're running on, 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 on solid ground. It's all fantastic. It's all great, fantastic, all fantastic. And then they go, um, just have a look down. Oh, that's how it goes. They build up the confidence, people invest, put their money in stuff, and then they crash it, and they take that money, and they take their, those resources, they take that real wealth um, from the population. And this is what we're seeing unfolding now. I'm not saying this massive global crash is going to come tomorrow, or next week, or next month, but it is coming. Why? Because it's in the plan uh, to come as part of this ongoing manipulation to install the Hunger Games um, society. And it's funny, you know, you have these different names for basically the same thing. Um, Mike Lambert at the Shen Clinic just down the road from here on the Isle of Wight has done magnificently to get me back to the point where I can actually start working again after the state I've been in in the last two weeks or so. And he points out that things like... Um, postnatal depression and ME are actually just names for adrenal burnout. Basically, a stress, overwork of the body, um, overwork of the mind uh, comes together to reach the point where the body ceases to function. And the, what the body is saying is, excuse me, over here, enough, enough, no more, or else it's going to get seriously worse. And uh, that's the wake-up call I've had in the last um, fortnight or more now. Uh, because um, I've just passed, that's what I'm going to talk about in the video cast this week, I've just passed, while I was ill, um, the 25th anniversary of when this journey consciously started for me. It started before that, without me realising that it was a journey. But from the time that I did realise, hey, something's happening here, um, it's just past 25 years to the day. And it's a good time to kind of reassess. And the, the body, my body, has said, it's that time. And uh, I tell you, uh, uh, just a few days ago, I didn't think I'd be sitting here now doing this um, okay. And um, it's going to take a few months to get back uh, to absolute health and absolute maximum strength. But uh, what Mike Lambert's done with me in the last uh, very short time is just uh, miraculous, uh, considering the state I was in. And it gives you pondering time when you're lying on your back looking at the ceiling or looking at the wall. And uh, I guess that's appropriate, given that this 25th anniversary has just passed. And the anniversary is of the day that I walked into the house of a psychic called Betty Shine uh, in a, a village near Brighton, south coast of England. And my life changed. And what was said that day and where I was going to go from there has absolutely turned out to be the case. And uh, it's been an extraordinary quarter of a century of 
challenge of revelation of awakened understanding to the nature of the very reality that we're experiencing and awakening to the forces that really manipulate and direct events and happenings in this reality we call planet Earth. Before I went to Betty Shine, I had some extraordinary experiences in the year before. Um, I was a presenter for BBC television. I was a national spokesman for the British Green Party. And I was getting on with my life. And then I started to feel in 1990, in fact through 1989 into 1990, that when I was in a room alone, I wasn't alone. It was like there was a presence there which you couldn't see but you could tangibly feel. And this went on, like I say, through 1989 when the Green Party had its first major success in Britain in the European elections. And although I should have been uh, focusing more and more on green politics, given the success that the, um, the party was suddenly having, my mind was starting to move elsewhere because of these experiences I was having. And it got more and more tangible to the point where one night in the first months of 1990, I was sitting on a bed in an empty hotel room called the Kensington Hilton near the BBC because I was working there. And I remember looking out into the apparently empty room and saying, look, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you're driving me up the wall. You couldn't see, see it, but you could feel it. It was there. And then a few days later, I uh, was with my then little boy, now very big boy, singer-songwriter uh, Gareth, my son, um, and we were playing football down the seafront, the town where I live. And I remember I had a book, I just bought a book, I think it was called The End of Nature, and I bought it to read it for, you know, environmental Green Party reasons, and but I never did read it because of what then happened. I um, I said to Gaz, we'll go and get some lunch down this cafe on the railway station on the seafront here. It's no longer there now, but uh, was very popular at the time. And when we got there, it was packed. So we turned to go up and find another one up in the town when a railway worker stopped me and started talking about um, football. And I was chatting away, and then when the conversation was over, I realised that Gareth wasn't there. But I knew where he would be. He would be in the, the news shop, the newspaper and bookshop, right next to the station. Part of the station, actually. So I walk in uh, to the door, and there he is, reading steam train books. And um, I said, come on, Gareth, we'll go up in the town and get some lunch. And at that moment, this is, um, must have been early March that kind of time, 1990, my feet wouldn't move. And this is the first kind of real, if you like, what, what is called paranormal uh, experience that I had had that was, again, tangible. And you know, I'm standing there, and my, it's, like, it's like magnets are pulling my feet to the ground. And, and I'm, what the hell's going on? And then I heard this, not voice, but this very strong thought form passed through my mind, said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I, I knew that bookshop very well, still there. And the books were m almost totally uh, romantic novels, Barbara Cartland, uh, Mills and Boone and all this stuff, which is not really my scene. But because of what was happening, I, I started to walk towards the books. In, um, in a daze, thinking what the hell's happening. And in among the romantic novels was this 
one book that stood out because it was different. And on the front was a woman's face. And the book was called Mind to Mind by a psychic called Betty Shine. So I picked the book, book up just because it was different from the rest. And I was kind of attracted to it in a kind of energetic way. And I picked it up, turned it over, and I read the blurb, which included the word psychic. So immediately I'm like, I wonder if this lady would pick up what I've been feeling around me for the last year. And I'd never been to a psychic before or anything like that. Um, but I thought, I've got to write to her. So I wrote to Betty and didn't tell her anything about what I was um, experiencing. I just said that I have arthritis, um, I don't take drugs for it, and maybe your hands-on healing, which is what she also did, might help. Which was genuine, I thought it might. Who knows, the drugs uh, were not an option for me, because if I'd have taken the drugs they gave me for arthritis when I was... Um, in my teens, I wouldn't sit in here now. And so she replied, and I went to see it. And um, she did, first of all, the hands-on healing, because that's what the whole thing appeared to be about. And I went along thinking, I'm just going to go with this and see what happens. And hands-on healing, of course, is just an exchange of energy. You know, it's mumbo jumbo. No, no, it's an exchange of energy, mate. Okay. When you come out of the Stone Age, give us a shout. Oh, you're a mainstream scientist. Still stands. And so, for the first two um, visits, it was hands-on healing, nice chat, interesting chat, and that was it. Then the third time I went, I was uh, lying on this bench like a medical bench thing in her front room and she was doing the hands-on healing near my left knee and suddenly I felt like this spider's web on my face like um this, this cobweb feeling I of course had not a clue what it was at the time but now I know that it was electromagnetic energy the same energy that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up um, when you're in an excited crowd, which is generating electromagnetism. And uh, what took me back when I felt this was that I'd read in the book, Mind to Mind, that when other dimensions of reality, other entities, if you like, are trying to lock into you, communicate with you, they you sometimes feel like a, a spider's web on your face because there's an electromagnetic connection being formed. Anyway, I said nothing to Betty Shine. She's the left knee. And suddenly, 10, 15 seconds later, um, she <coughs> throws her head back and says, my God, this is powerful. I've got to close my eyes for this one. At which point I'm going, ooh, what's happening here? And suddenly, both that day and the next time I came, which was, I only went like three or four times. Um, she said she was getting messages which were to be passed on to me. And um, I wrote a book as a result of all this called Truth Vibrations. <laughs> and um, I have um, gone through it, uh, this um, experience again, in um, The Perception Deception. And uh, this is what came out of... Uh, uh, Betty's uh, mouth through Betty if you like um, at that time just today a few days past 25 years to the day and the day that my life changed dramatically Divergent uh, it's obviously a movie it came out this year and has done, done the rounds of the cinemas but I didn't get to see it then but I, uh, I saw it on DVD very very symbolic movie which I'll, I'll talk about uh, later but the key thing is divergent being a divergent in other words um, having another way 
of looking at the world, another way of looking at world events. Because the whole um, kind of theme of Divergent is that the population was broken up into certain sections, which were basically uh, perceptions of the world. And you had to pick one of these perceptions in effect. And what they were terrified of were people who had the ability to have multiple perceptions in the way I'm describing it. And they were called divergent. In other words, they had the ability to think across the, the spectrum rather than what we would call in the box, in the bubble. And it's no accident that throughout human history, those in authority have been terrified of what this movie calls the divergent people. Those who have the ability to free think, to, to take in information, experience, things they see, and reach their own conclusions on them, rather than being told what to think by, in the modern world, politicians or the media telling them what they're seeing means. You know, it's, um, it's fascinating to watch uh, studies where you have a set of pictures and you put a voiceover on it. And what the voiceover is basically telling you is what you're looking at. It's telling you what the pictures mean and what the, the, the pictures are um, in terms of their relevance. But if you put another voiceover on the same pictures, suddenly the pictures look very different. Um, it's much underestimated, this uh, process, this, this programming process of putting up pictures and then the voiceover telling the viewer what the pictures mean. What a divergent mind does is decide what those pictures mean in its own unique view, not the herd view of being told what to think. And one of the examples of divergent thinking, divergent perception, is the massively important and fundamental mass mind control technique that I um, called many years ago now problem reaction solution. Create the problem covertly, blame it on someone else, present a cover story for why it happened and who was responsible. And after the creating the problem, you then tell the public what you want them to believe about the problem so that they will react, reaction, uh, in the way that you want. Um, fear, outrage, something must be done, what, what are they going to do about it, all these things. And then they can move to stage three, which is the solution. Those who've covertly created the problem, got the public reaction, do something, fear, all the rest of it, then offer openly the solutions to the problems they've created. So, uh, you know, you look at 9-11, uh, a non-divergent mind would look at that and believe the official story, even though hardly one strand of the official story um, can be true when connected with other strands of the official story. If that's true, that can't be true. If that's true, that can't be true, and so on. But the non-divergent mind just takes that information from the authorities, and, and this is, of course, the, the mentality that dominates, dominates uh, globally the mainstream media, uh, what a nightmare situation is that that is when a non-divergent mind is actually the, the middle man and woman between what the, what the authorities are telling you and what the people are hearing. Um, so this um, non-divergent mind is how 